encounters. Um, sorry, I had a pop-up window. As part of SOAS Festival of Ideas, um, you'll have a really, this should be a real treat today. You have an amazing um, group of panelists who've all worked on cross-cultural cross encounters in their different ways, uh, all in an interdisciplinary way. And um, from a variety of uh, regions in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Now you might say cross-cultural encounters sounds very vague, but I think what they all have in common is that they have looked in particular at the way um, knowledge travels uh, across the world, how knowledge emerges and is developed, and all in their different ways. They are trying to challenge the way, the very uh, often very Eurocentric ways in which knowledge is generated and allowed to travel and to be disseminated within academia and beyond. And as you'll see, um, I think all of them have engaged with collaborators uh, outside the UK, outside their institutions, uh, very often outside of academia as well, artists, for example. And so long before decolonizing the curriculum became a buzzword um, or a concern within British academia, they were already asking critical questions about the direction of travel, uh, of knowledge and the very way in which uh, knowledge emerged um, and very important questions about power relations in the way in which knowledge emerged about cross-cultural encounters. So we should have time for Q&A at the end, but first of all, let me introduce you, um, let me introduce Professor Lindy Wei Dovi, who is a professor of film and screen studies at SOAS. She's the principal investigator of a five-year ERC funded project called Screen Worlds Decolonizing Film and Screen Studies. And this is what she's going to talk to us about. She's also a researcher, a teacher, a filmmaker, and a film curator. So she's very much a um, practitioner as well. And her work aims to combine film scholarship and practice in mutually enlightening and creative ways. She is from South Africa originally. She is an expert and a very passionate expert on African filmmaking. And uh, just to mention two of her key books, which have already become absolute classics in the literature on film in Africa. Creating Africa in the Age of Film Festivals, 2015, and African Film and Literature from 2009. Um, she's also a festival, film festival found, founder, a director and, and curator. Um, and more generally, I think she has um, really helped to raise the profile of African cinema within the UK. So I think we'll see Lindy Wei's film. There's a video now. Uh, sorry, my video has been uh, disabled. Um, sorry, Ellen. Sorry, uh, can I just ask the host to enable my video? I'm not able to, uh, to put it on. Okay, start my video, great, okay. Thank you so much, uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Ellen, for that extremely generous introduction. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, and I'm going to be uh, sharing my screen because I've actually pre-recorded my, uh, my presentation tonight because I wanted to embed uh, a small video clip and some images. So you're seeing me uh, presenting this a few days ago and then I look forward to the discussions with everybody afterwards. So here goes. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much to Amina uh, for inviting me to be part of this panel and thank you very much also to Ellen for chairing and to my fellow panelists and of course thank you to all of you for being here to listen to us and participate today. So I'm really delighted to be given an opportunity to share with you the vision and work for the project African Screen Worlds Decolonizing Film and Screen Studies which is a five-year research project funded by the European Research Council and hosted here at SOAS at the Center for Creative Industries, Media and Screen Studies. 
The project began in June uh, last year, June 2019. So it's only about a year old. So we're really still in our infancy. And we have, of course, really had to reimagine um, elements, many elements of the project due to COVID-19 striking, just as the project was getting up and running. But despite the difficulties, what has been most exciting for me as the PI of this project, the uh, principal investigator, has been seeing how through people working as a team towards shared goals and significant self-flexivity, we've been able to turn um, many of the constraints and problems into possibilities for even more meaningful and perhaps hopefully even more decolonized cross-cultural encounters. Our project uh, currently involves more than 100 people from all across the world, and particularly uh, people from different contexts in Africa and in Asia. But so that you can at least see some of our core team members, I'd like to play you um, a clip from our project trailer, which is something we put together quite quickly last year uh, as the project was launching to try to explain our vision for the project. For many years, I have been researching Nigerian film, politics and social change, as well as cinema audiences. Nigerians have the largest film industry in Africa and are avid consumers of locally and globally produced media. With an estimated population size of 170 million, Nigeria is a powerhouse of creative energy and its film industry has been marked by immense business acumen and engagement with new technologies. Yet the Nigerian film industry, its film and filmmakers are relatively marginalized in film and screen studies scholarship, which is a gap. As part of a Screen Worlds project, I'm excited to fill this gap by exploring how Nigerian screen worlds are rapidly evolving, as well as the various platforms through which Nigeria and African films are accessed and consumed in Nigeria. This project also includes making a film that will examine the nature of contemporary Nigerian screen worlds through small, large and immersive screens and delve into the fascinating history of how the Nigerian film industry was born. It's of course a huge privilege to have the funding to do a project with so many different people from around the world involved, which constantly brings cross-cultural encounters into play. Um, the problem, in my view, is the dominance of the arrogant lone wolf scholarship model, which is very much a model tied to a colonial patriarchal system of knowledge production, where one person is the star, the expert on a topic that is really too vast for uh, one person to begin to understand. If we translate this uh, problem into our particular field of film and screen studies, we can see that if we respect that films emerge out of particular cultural and linguistic contexts, then no one person can ever become an expert on the entirety of global cinemas or world cinema. We can only research aspects of this vast field in depth. This means that the task of turning our field from a largely Eurocentric one, as it's, con it's currently constituted, into a far more globally representative one relies on all of us working in the discipline. 
To avoid the issues of lone wolf scholarship, the Screen Worlds project has a methodology that is based on four main principles. First of all, an emphasis on knowledge exchange rather than capacity building. Second, cross-cultural comparative analysis. Third, co-authorship between people who specialize in different cinematic cultural contexts. And fourth, creative approaches to research. So I'd like to just um, go through each of these and give you a few examples from the project as to how we can put these into action. Okay, so first of all, in terms of an emphasis on knowledge exchange rather than capacity building. In our view, the reason that it has been so difficult to decolonize many social sciences disciplines, uh, for example, development studies, is that hierarchy is built into the core vocabulary of these fields. Um, for example, the word development itself, which implies a hierarchy in which the West is seen as superior to the rest and sits along some imaginary teleological scale of evolution. Another term used regularly in development studies is capacity building, often paradoxically when discussing egalitarian partnerships between the global north and the global south. But again, this very term suggests that the global north needs to help the global south to build this capacity, rather than rethink the very nature of these relationships, which are of course based on historical exploitation of the riches of the global south, by the global north, which has led to our current unequal distribution of resources. At Screen Worlds, coming from an arts and humanities perspective, we prefer to think about creative partnerships where everyone is valued as an equal player with a distinct knowledge base and personal history and personal experiences, and where we can all contribute ideas and learn from one another. We also recognize that sometimes what is needed is not cross-cultural or transnational encounters, but rather safe spaces in which people who are located within one place or who share a particular identity simply want to have discussions on their own. And this brings us to the very definition of decolonization, which of course has distinct meanings in different contexts. So we don't feel like it is the right of our project to finally determine what decolonizing means and then try to compel others to take that on board. People in their own contexts need to decide that for themselves and our project can only act as a kind of prompt and conversation partner. On this front, I'd like to highlight as an example, the workshop that we ran with Nigerian colleagues on the topic decolonizing film and screen studies in Nigeria which was held in March of this year and co-organized by Dr. Anulika Agina and Dr. Patrick Oloko. Rather than being a regular conference with 15 minute papers that are rattled off and then quickly forgotten, it was conceptualized more creatively and openly as a space for self-reflection and sharing about pedagogical practices related to teaching film studies and filmmaking that come at different personal and institutional approaches. Those of us who are not Nigerian contributed ideas and thoughts through a special workbook we made in advance and through presentations during the workshop. But the focus was very much on creating the right conditions for an event mostly run by Nigerians or Nigerians who are teaching in Nigerian universities. And COVID-19 helped to ensure this by striking just before those of us who are based in the UK and Europe were due to fly out to Nigeria to participate, meaning that we could only participate in the event uh, at a distance through Zoom. Not being able to have these cross-cultural encounters was of course a huge disappointment for us, but perhaps this also created a dynamic in which Nigerian participants could focus more on their own contexts. Okay, I'd like to address our second and third uh, issue of cultural comparative analysis and co-authorship, because I have a specific example of how these two are working together on our project. Now, just building on what I was saying before, inevitably interesting perspectives on film pedagogy in different cultures and institutions 
um, continued to arise across the workshop in Lagos. And this is something that we are encouraging in other aspects of the project as well. For example, in our edited collection um, called Global Screen Worlds, in which we put out an open call for participation last year. And through that have been pairing up scholars from very different parts of the world. And in some cases who have never met one another before, who have similar interests, nevertheless, to co-develop and co-author research. There are 30 participants from around the world involved in this collection, and some fascinating connections have emerged through our pairing methodology. For example, we have an established professor in Madagascar, paired up with an early career researcher in Northeast India, where they are looking together at the popularity of Korean drama in each of these two contexts. Now, before COVID-19 happened, we had planned for everyone to meet uh, in person at a workshop to start building up this research. But given that this is not uh, possible for the moment, we've instead moved this research development process online. And this has in itself been a humbling lesson in the inequalities across cultures, where some people have had easy access to the digital world and other people have not. But in most, pace, uh, most cases, people have found a way to get online for conversations and are really excited about the approach that we're ad adopting, which is creating a network of care amongst scholars located in different parts of the world, and very importantly, cross-generationally, with a mix of established and early career scholars. Being forced to shift online has actually made us realize that for so long, we've been working on assumptions that really don't need to hold. For example, waiting for in-person conferences to uh, make connections and network with other scholars in our fields. But we all know that in-person conferences are very expensive, not very environmentally friendly, and often not very equitable in terms of who gets access to visas or not. Beyond this, rather than put pressure on our participants at this very difficult time, we have delayed our deadlines and are instead encouraging a slow scholarship mode, one in which we are slowly yet collectively co-creating this edited volume, um, educating one another about our own uh, areas we work on. And we hope this will also bring more coherence to the volume as a result. Finally, the fourth Screen Worlds principle I mentioned before was adopting creative approaches to research. Quite literally, our creative approaches involve moving away from conventional academic outputs, such as written books and articles, and towards modes of knowledge production that are less rational and blogger-centric, for example, films and audiovisual essays. In a field like film and screen studies, there's an even greater argument to think about our object of study, film, in audiovisual ways, so as to respect the medium itself. These creative approaches can also potentially help us to decolonize our practice by undisciplining some of the strictures and chronologies of academia through invoking and involving different senses, the emotions and affect, and finding new capacities and ways of thinking about the world. Creativity can also be more inclusive through allowing the use of different languages beyond the dominance of English, and through a less a strict set of criteria and expectations for publication. Some people, for example, who struggle to write academic papers might bloom when making um, an audiovisual work because they are visual rather than textual thinkers. Now, I would just like to close by saying that even though I've critiqued the lone wolf mode of scholarship here, there does have to be a space made within academia, of course, for individual creativity as well. Collaboration is wonderful, but it can be idealized and it can be very difficult as well as extremely inspiring. So we need appreciation, I think, of how each human being is not so much part of a monolithic, essentialized culture or even an assemblage of intersectional identities. Some who's being unique and constantly in dialogue with the world. This kind of idea of the human being is described beautifully by the Cameroonian filmmaker Jean-Pierre Bicolo through his concept of mantisme. So I would like to close with his words. 
Jean-Pierre Bicolo says, Mantisme is a way of apprehending the world based on my experience, my education, my culture, and my environment. Mantisme is a system of thought that we virtually assimilate to a language that is unique to each individual, a language that I permanently negotiate with the language of the other with whom I would share an experience, education, culture, and a similar environment. Thank you once again for listening and I look forward to our discussions. Thank you so much, Lindy Wei. This was really striking start. Um, sorry, I activated my microphone. I hope you can all hear me. This was a, a striking start and um, you really raised some themes in the video that I'm sure um, the other speakers will come back to and which we'll definitely return to in the Q&A. So I will just introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Dina Matar. So Dina is reader in political communication and Arab media um, at SOAS. She's also chair of the Center for Global Media and Communication uh, and also chair of the Center for Palestine Studies at SOAS. She used to be a correspondent and an editor covering the Middle East, Asia, Africa and Europe. And her research is interdisciplinary, of course, but really located at the intersection of communication, politics and culture, memory and narrative practices. And she's also an activist um, and all with a particular focus on the Levant. So Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan and Syria as areas of research. She's also the co-founder of the Middle East Journal of Culture and Communication. She's the co-editor of the SOAS Palestine Studies book series. And she's the co-founding editor of a brand new book series on political communication and media practices of the Middle East and North Africa uh, with Bloomsbury Press. And um, her monograph, What It Means to be Palestinian, Stories of Palestinian Peoplehood has been used as a script for the internationally renowned animation movie, The Tower. So many of us would love our books to be turned into films. Dina has achieved this. And I think that ties in very well with what Lindy Wei was just saying about diversifying our research outputs. So Dina is going to talk to us about narratives and decoloniality. Hey everyone, thank you, Helene, and thank you, Linda Wee, for such a, a brilliant introduction to the panel. Um, I feel a little bit uh, kind of, I cannot stand in your shoes, but I'll try. Um, so without further ado, I just don't want to give a long talk, but I want to, to try and talk about what really has motivated me through my work experience as a journalist and then later on as an academic. And I want to focus on uh, the notion or the concept of narrative uh, and how we can use narrative as a, a methodology plus a, an object of study or uh, you know, a, a, the, the, the center of our studies to understand um, how we can produce different ways of knowing and uh, you know, decolonial decolon uh, decolon uh, practices. And I think I speak here more like, in, like from the media scholarship, which remains very much dominated by uh, Western-centric approaches and normative approaches to understanding how, real of, how media functions in society. But in this talk, I draw on the premise that uh, powerful, discursive, and political entities, including the mainstream media, play a key role in the production of knowledge in the world. And this, as we all know about it, is not like rocket science. But I also suggest that discussion of the global South as an imagined spatiality, um, often defined by its perceived uh, differences from the global North, must address how this imagination is interlinked with narrative as image and discourse. It can be film, it can be screen, but also it's the text um, and also how we speak, you know, the, the political lang the language, the cultural language that we speak. And as such, ask how narrative plays a role in the emergence and persistence of particular uh, 
epistemic formations that are sustained by material and structural conditions of power, but also how um, narrative can also play a role in, in resistance and in producing counter narratives of knowledge. Um, I focus on mediated narratives, that is the production and the consumption of narrative in the media, but also in the public uh, space. Uh, not in the sense of looking at narrative as ordinary stories, but in the sense of situated histories, situated histories and experiences that come from a particular uh, socio-political uh, context. Uh, because these situated histories can tell us about lives and experiences that emerge in uh, structural and material conditions. And I do not um, ignore these material conditions in the production of narratives. More directly, I also think about uh, mediated narratives in my work as modes of experiencing the world and also as a work of interpretation of the world. So, it becomes, you know, maybe it sounds too, uh, too academic, but it becomes quite an interesting aspect of looking uh, at narrative as uh, producing uh, different ways of knowing and experiencing and interpreting the world. While I work basically on the Arab world and on political communication, which is the relationship between politics and communication, also thinking about politics as being about culture and about cultural encounters, I'm more interested in mediated narratives about and by about Palestine and the Palestinians. My interest in this area is partly personal, political, because I'm Palestinian, and partly because I believe that perhaps looking at, at this context can contribute to decolonial thinking, understood as a particular kind of critical theory. And particularly as a particular kind of critical theory that is uh, relevant for uh, the study of uh, media and communication and political communication practices in the non-West. So my questions when I go around and you know I kind of get very passionate about that is um, I try and understand what people do with media. How do they do their work of interpretation? And why does it all matter? You know, what is the point of it? Um, the arguments about decolonial critical th theory is familiar to most of you here, and, and particularly members of this panel, and to many of the audience, particularly if you are from SOAS. Uh, but the work of decolonial approaches is central, is central uh, to the wider project of what we call de-Westernization, internationalization, and decolonization of media and communication studies. And also the subfields of media and communication studies such as audience studies and internet and digital uh, studies more broadly. In my research over the past 15 years, I have explored the relationship between narratives, who produces them, who uses them, who is allowed to produce them, who is not allowed to produce them, and I also think of, you know, and locate them within the social and political context. So in a sense, I never forget the context in terms of trying to explain what these narratives mean. Um, for me, a former journalist and academic, I also see news as narrative, as a form of narrative that is uh, dictated by structures and boundaries, nuance and principles. Um, but I also think of journalists and academics as storytellers in their own way. And maybe these, you know, it's just my way of thinking about it. It, make, it makes it easier for me to have made the shift from a journalist to an academic. But going back to Palestine, um, I think Palestine is a rich and productive context to interrogate the role of narrative in the construction, the maintenance, and um, as well as the subversion of powerful epistemic formations that have prevailed in the production of knowledge about the Palestinians, the representation in the media. How, how, do we, how do we see them? How do we imagine the Palestinians? And that's the imagination it is mostly coming to our, you know, not myself, but to most people who uh, have not been to Palestine or have not really been uh, in uh, contact with Palestinians. It's an imagination that is, uh, comes through the media in different ways. Um, and I think that uh, these 
these um, uh, the role of media in supporting, enhancing, or legitimizing particular ways or particular cultural practices, particular ways of knowing, uh, in contexts other than Palestine, has been well discussed and well rehearsed in the field of media and cultural studies. But debate, the debate about whether this role can be ascribed to what is called as the power, um, the symbolic, concentrated symbolic power of media institutions or whether it is about global capital, or wh whether it is about the relationship between political entities and the media, or the ability um, to, of some entities to cement the control through the media remains an open question. And we're still debating that, uh, this question to this day. Um, for media power is not a tangible reality, but a social process organized around distinctions between an, an, a manufactured media world and the ordinary world of ordinary people. In the case of Palestine, as has been well rehearsed in the literature, there is no doubt that how much we in the West see, hear about and know about Palestine and the Palestinians comes via mainstream Western media and other digital platforms. This is particularly true in, in, true in this age of crisis, the COVID crisis. And I think one of the key issues of the COVID uh, crisis is that it has actually made invisible um, people like the Palestinians. Uh, you, unless we want to go and find out what is happening, we don't know what is happening out there. And, um, but also the question of who decides what is being said and heard, who gets to speak, cannot be disconnected from uh, global dominant uh, narratives that produce commonplace, commonplace assumptions about the other and then episteme which embed themselves in the media, the academy, and other places. The power of narrative in this sense is its ability to act as a prism through which political relations are seen. Who has the right to narrate, whose stories and memories enter the history books are questions at the core of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's global narration and appropriation, and to how it is understood and how it is to be dealt with culturally and politically. Uh, the right to narrate is also a question of enunciation. When, why, where, what, for. Walter Mignola talked about that a lot in talking about, um, you know, post, you know, the relationship between um, the colonizer and the colonized. And this can lead to uh, the creation of knowledge and trans uh, from formations at the very heart um, of any decolonial inquiry. So who? We have, you know, we need to keep asking the questions when, who, why, where, and where. These are kind of key questions in, a, you know, the, the 101 of um, being a journalist. Of course, Edward Said, uh, for him, the right to narrate, as he said uh, in his article, Permission to Narrate, published in 1984, that long ago, is relevant because this struggle over narrative is also a struggle over knowledge um, and power. What I want to say in the end here is that um, I, you know, my first book, which is what it means to be Palestinian, I, I began the book with, with the intention of trying to uh, find out media's role in, in people's life and think about Palestinians' reaction to media narratives. And when I went to interview Palestinians in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and uh, Palestine, and Israel, um, the question that arose was a different one. Because what turned out to be the case is that uh, the people that I interviewed wanted just to tell their stories. And this is what somehow pushed me into that direction. Because I, I went in uh, with an interpretive framework with a theory to try and, and apply it to the to these people. But what happened is that through my uh, you know empirical work, it turned out that what um, the informants, the interviewees, told me actually structured the knowing in different ways. Uh, and I want to end here um, by saying that you know one of the most interesting aspects of um, the fact that we have digital media available for people or kind of uh, in, in different, in different um, places is the fact that people can use it to narrate. But 
whether they are narrating to themselves or to a smaller group or to the outside world is, is a, a big question. But it's worth looking at these narrations. It's worth looking at uh, the production of stories about lives and experiences and use that perhaps as a way to um, think with and about uh, the, the project of decolonization that I think many of us are interested in. Thanks. Sorry, we spoke a lot. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, that was another amazing presentation and I had to restrain myself from asking you lots of questions. And this, the way you ended showing us um, how collecting narratives in itself is a deeply political act, we'll definitely have to uh, return to this in the discussion. So thank you so much, Dina. We are going to now move on to uh, Dr. Marlos Janssen, uh, who is a fellow anthropologist. Um, I didn't introduce myself as an anthropologist at the beginning, I was a bit rushed, sorry, but I'm also an anthropologist of West Africa, just like Marlos. So Marlos is reader in West African anthropology. She is associate director of um, research at SOAS, and her research really is at the intersection of anthropology and religion. Um, Unlike many anthropologists, Marlos has actually achieved the extraordinary feat of doing long-term fieldwork in two completely different locations in West Africa, the Gambia and Nigeria, and to actually produce two books coming out of work. So her first um, monograph was Crossing Religious Boundaries, Islam, sorry, that's her latest monograph, actually. Her latest monograph is called Crossing Religious Boundaries, Islam, Christianity, and Yoruba Religion in Lagos. That's coming out uh, very soon in 2021 with Cambridge University Press. Um, very highly expected monograph. And her previous one uh, coming out of the field in the Gambia is called Islam, Youth and Modernity in the Gambia, the Tablighi Jamaat that was also with Cambridge University Press in 2014. And that monograph um, won that year the RAI, uh, the Royal Anthropological Institute, very prestigious Amory Talbot Prize for African Anthropology. So hopefully Marlos' next book will win the prize another time. Um, now Marlos is uh, one of the presenters who have collaborated um, with practitioners outside of academia. She has um, collaborated with a Nigerian award-winning photographer, Akin Lunde Akinleye, and that resulted in the traveling photo exhibition entitled The Spiritual Highway, Religious World Making in Mega City, Lagos. And Malus will talk to us about decolonizing the study of religion. Thank you very much, Helen, for this very, very kind introduction. I should mention that also Helen won the uh, RAI um, Emory Talbot Prize for African Anthropology. So for her fantastic work on, um, on, on Senegal. So I should have mentioned it. So anyway, um, other than um, Helen, I want to uh, thank a few other people. First of all, thanks to Amina Yakin, to Stephanie Gurant, to Angelica Bachera. Uh, for organizing this festival and for organizing this panel. And also many thanks to the SOAS uh, Decolonizing Working Group and to Mira Sebaratnam, to Amina Yakin, and to Andrea Cornwall for steering the discussion about uh, decolonizing teaching and research at SOAS. I have learned a lot from these uh, discussions and I'm still learning. In this very short presentation, and I will try to be very short, I want to talk briefly about how I have tried to decolonize my research as well as my research methodology. So as Helen already mentioned, my work is at the intersection of anthropology and religion and West Africa, in particular, uh, the Gambia and Nigeria are my fields of ethnographic specialization. And both anthropology and the study of religion have a colonial history. When anthropologists as well as scholars of religion speak about religion, they often refer to doctrine, to belief, and to dogma. This Eurocentric conceptualization of religion is dictated by what anthropologist Halal Assad calls a Protestant legacy that needs to be located historically, 
but should not be taken as being universally valid. For many of the religious practitioners with whom I worked in first the Gambia and later in Nigeria, religion was less a matter of orthodoxy, that's correct belief and doctrinal conformity, and much more of orthopraxy, correct religious practice. Rather than belief, many of my research participants in Nigeria's former capital, Lagos, tended to privilege the performative power of religious practice that helped them cope with the contingencies of urban living. And this entailed that I approach religion first and foremost as lived practice. In order to study religion through the vector of religious practice and lived experience, during my research on the Tabliki Jamaat in the Gambia, I recorded the biographical narratives of young Tablikis. And for those of you who are not familiar with the movement, um, Tabliki Jamaat is a transnational Islamic missionary movement it has its origins um, in the reformist tradition that emerged in India in the mid 19th century. My monograph, Islam, Youth and Modernity in the Gambia, explores how a movement that originated in South Asia could appeal to the local Muslim population, youth and women in particular, in a West African setting. And by recording the biographical narratives of five Gambian Tabliki men and women, the book provides an understanding of the ambiguities and the contradictions young people are confronted with in their renegotiation of Muslim identity. By giving my interlocutors a voice, and Dina already spoke uh, so eloquent on, on, on narratives, so by trying to give my interlocutors a voice, I wanted to challenge the conventional assumption presented in the media of the Tabiki Jamaat as a fundamentalist movement, as a breeding ground for potential radicals. Since the movement's aim is to restore a pure form of Islam by returning to the fundamentals of the faith as laid down in the Quran, as well as in the Sunnah, the prophetic traditions, we could say that the Tabiki Jamaat is a fundamentalist movement. However, my interlocutor's interpretation of fundamentalism differed from how it is presented in the media. So my attempt to question Western frameworks of analysis that are often taken for granted, and my use of biographical narrative as a means to put my interlocutors' experiences and voices at center stage, tied in with my decolonial research approach. But although I've tried to do justice to my interlocutors' voices, in the end, the stories that I recorded are not just their words. It is me who recorded them and interpreted them. And it's possible that my interlocutors do not recognize themselves in these stories. Unfortunately, I was unable to ask them since they were not interested in reading my book. All they were interested in was me to convert to Islam. So that made me aware of the limitations of my research methods in an effort to move beyond conventional text-based research methods. In my current project, I collaborate with a photographer in order to visualize how religion is being embodied. And I will come back to this collaboration in a moment, but first I would like to brief uh, to briefly talk about the Tabliki book's afterlife. Not only do anthropologists and scholars of religion have the tendency to conceptualize religion um, in terms of doctrine and belief, they also often seem to think that to theorize means being illegible. In order to reach a wider audience than just academics, I wanted to write in an accessible style. And I think that my life story approach helped to draw in a larger readership beyond the usual suspects of fellow anthropologists, religion scholars, and Africanists. I was therefore very pleased and honored when I received a message from novelist Zadie Smith, who asked whether she could endorse my book in her novel, Swing Time. It turned out that she had used several of the ethnographic situations that I describe um, in my monograph in a fictionalized form in her novel Swing Time, which is partly set in the Gambia. If you haven't read it already, I can highly recommend reading it. The reason for mentioning this to you is not just to self-promote. It illustrates something that I find very important, namely that we bring our scholarship to the public that we're making it relevant to present day social problems. As academics, we have greater responsibilities to the world than just our intellectual parochialisms. And I think this is also what Andrea mentioned this morning in our uh, wonderful response to um, Adam Habib's wonderful uh, keynote uh, um, uh, lecture, when she said, we have to rethink the role of the scholar hermit. 
So multiplying the voices in public debates, not only the voices of our research participants, but also the voices of novelists, photographers, filmmakers, activists, is in my opinion part of decolonizing research. I started by saying that the study of religion in Africa has long been pursued from a hegemonic Western perspective, reinforcing a Christian conceptualization of religion that emphasizes belief at the expense of practical dimensions of Africans' lived religiosity. Therefore, there is, according to the professor of Islamic studies, Abdul Qadir Tayyub, a pressing need for a reorientation of the study of religion, taking to account the transregional connections between the European centers of knowledge production and the former areas of imperial, imperial um, European outreach, and acknowledging the validity of different ways of seeing the world. And highlighting this validity, Atiyo Mbemba, whose name has already been mentioned several times this morning, calls for a less inward looking and parochial attitude and a more open what he calls pluriversity, which he defines as a process of knowledge production that is open to epistemic diversity via a horizontal strategy of openness to dialogue among different epistemic traditions. So inspired by Mbembe, in my current research project, I have tried to study religion in Lagos in the pluriversity by transcending the conceptual as well as the methodological rigidity that dominates much scholarship on religion. And this approach is very much in line with the ways in which my research participants experience their religion. Indeed, many of them describe themselves as religious shoppers who had changed their religious allegiances or who had shifted uh, between them. Opposing conventional understandings of religion as a unified category and as a bounded regime, for my interlocutors, combining multiple religious traditions is an integral part of daily experience in Lagos. So let me conclude by saying a few words about my collaboration with the Nigerian award-winning um, um, photographer, Akintunda Akinleye which resulted in a traveling photo exhibition, The Spiritual Highway, Religious World Making in Mecca City, Lagos. Well, due to COVID-19, the exhibition is currently stored in a colleague cellar in San Francisco, rather than on display at the University of Stanford. By crossing boundaries between uh, academic and artistic modes of representation, Akintun and I have tried to study religion as a set of aesthetical as well as spatial practices of world making that explores how religion takes place in daily practice and how religious practitioners are engaged in making religion happen, thereby allowing for a broader conception of religion in which doctrine and greed give away to individual experience and to practice. By adopting an ethnographic approach that foregrounds subjectivity and lived experience and by collaborating with artists such as novelists, photographers, as well as filmmakers, we will be able to develop new ways to generate as well as to disseminate knowledge. Such methods which aim to undiscipline knowledge, a phrase which was already used by uh, Lynn Dewey in her opening film, are at the heart of current epistemologies to decolonize knowledge. Here it should be mentioned that the Research Excellence Framework, the REF, and for those of you who are not familiar with the REF, it's a system for assessing the quality of research in UK higher education institutions. Well, the REF still measures academic output largely by conventional means, i.e. written publications. Although a growing number of academics are developing creative research methodologies that go beyond the limitations of textual methods, as this festival as well as this panel shows, these have yet to be recognized by those judging the quality and the impact of our work. Only then can we make real headway with decolonizing knowledge. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Matters another amazing presentation and there's more and more to discuss. I completely agree with you that collaboration with artists really is one of the way forwards and that we actually stand um, to learn a great deal from artists about how to see the world 
in new ways and, and how to really better understand um, local epistemologies. So I do hope this exhibition will come out of the basement in Stanford um, and travel some more. So um, before I move on to Amina, I was asked to just remind the audience that you can use the Q&A uh, function to ask questions. We will try to answer them as we go along if we can, but otherwise we will summarize them at the end. So we'll now move on to um, Dr. Amina Yakin, who is um, director of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. Amina is reader in Urdu and in post-colonial studies at SOAS. <clears throat> she is chair of the decolonizing working group. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and she has a forthcoming monograph 2021 entitled Gender, Sexuality and Feminism in Pakistani Women's Poetry with Anthem Press. That sounds amazing. I absolutely want to read it when it comes out. She's also uh, the co-author of Framing Muslims, Stereotyping and Representation After 9-11 with Harvard University Press 2011. And she has co-edited uh, lots of uh, works, including uh, Contesting Islamophobia, Media, Politics and Culture, 2019, and Muslims, Trust and Multiculturalism, New Directions, 2018. Um, and also Culture, Diaspora and Modernity in Muslim Writing, 2012. So very productive. Her research is always interdisciplinary um, and it engages with contemporary contexts of Muslim life as well as the politics of culture in Pakistan, which is her country of origin. She has been a collaborating partner on two projects. Uh, one, the AHRC funded International Research Network on Framing Muslims. And the second one is the RC UK funded Muslims, Trust and Cultural Dialogue. And uh, Amina will speak to us on Muslim cosmopolitanism in Muhammad Ibad's Masjid al Kotaba. I'm not going to try to pronounce this, so over to you, Amina. Thank you, thank you, Helen. And um, thank you to fellow panelists for really inspiring papers. I hope uh, that I can um, measure up. I think it also reiterates um, the atmosphere of creative thinking that is present at SOAS that is part of how um, work develops and formulates over time. This particular um, paper comes out of um, my, uh, my projects and it is actually something that uh, goes back to what uh, Dina was saying about that struggle over narrative. So this this paper, while I've kind of worked in lots of interdisciplinary contexts, is, is that aim to look at narrative more closely. As someone who has taught in an area studies department and moved to an English department in the School of Arts, there have been some deep learning experiences about how disciplines can determine our knowledge. So in this paper, I attempt to unpack some of those biases by referring to my research that is of relevance to a number of disciplines, but gets lost in silos. I reconnect with the notion of cosmopolitanism that was referred to in this morning's opening address with Professor Adam Habib, and the concept um, that I pick up in this particular paper of La Convivencia as a means of reconnecting with the political philosophy of the Indian Muslim poet Muhammad Iqbal. He has historically been understood more as a Muslim separatist and less as a cosmopolitan intellectual. I summarize a close reading of one of his major poems that was written toward the end of his career in Urdu. And I'm going to race through this, uh, so forgive me for um, not being detailed. I underline the ambivalence of his philosophy, politics and the narrative of modernity that he contributed to at the turn of the 20th century from his vantage point as a Muslim intellectual, a poet and a political activist. Through this poem, I'm interested in considering the influence of Al-Andalus in the Iberian pen peninsula on Iqbal's thought. 
Iqbal, a strong believer in the idea of the perfect community, the Ummah, was always in search of the past to be able to connect to the present and to bolster his critique of nationalism. To understand the phenomenon of community, I turn to the form of Urdu poetry as a popular narrative genre that offers an alternative glimpse into the lived politics of religion and culture of the 19th and 20th centuries. In my research, I have looked at the crossover value of Urdu poetry as a signifier of national, local and gendered cultures, forming an intercultural mosaic across multiple identities and identifications. Um, it is in this spirit that I turn to the genre of Urdu poetry to search for the earlier narrative of Al-Andalus. Interestingly, Al-Andalus comes to prominence as part of a late 19th century reformist drive in Urdu poetry. And given the time constraints, I'm going to jump over the 19th century poets to give, get to Muhammad Iqbal, who is referred to as early modern and modern. Both categorizations are particular reference points in European histories of the subcontinent. So I use them as a point of reference rather than as an indication of discrete categories. As a poet, Iqbal is claimed by many. He, according to Anri Shimmel, uh, he was a talisman in Pakistan and um, Ali Khamenei, uh, the supreme leader of Iran, claimed an Iqbalian heritage in 1986 with the proclamation that the Islamic Republic of Iran is the embodiment of Iqbal's dream. Hafiz and Linda Malik place Iqbal at the heart of Lahore's 19th century performative tradition embodied in a regular Mushaira poetry symposium. He is celebrated nationally along with Muhammad Ali Jinnah as a founding father of Pakistan. Active in politics, he gave two presidential addresses in 1930 and 1932 at the annual sessions of the All India Muslim League and was a delegate at the second and third roundtable conferences to discuss India's constitutional future. He was well known to Jawaharlal Nehru and to Jinnah. In his search for a utopian Muslim community, Iqbal looks towards the cross-cultural mix of Al-Andalus as an alternate space. And it's that idea of utopia that I want to question. Over a period of time, his poems shifted from a territorial recognition of the self to a de-territorialized homeland and offered alternative readings of the Muslim holy land of Hijaz. The political scientist and scholar Robert Lee argues that Iqbal is a proposer of a general authenticity, seeking to liberate humanity from the cl clutches of both tradition and modernity, from the mysticism of the East and the reason of the West, from the imperialism of the West and the submiss submissiveness of the East. Lee's reading of authenticity suggests that Iqbal was looking for a middle ground between an Indo-European secular ethics and a moral tradition, and not simply a civilizational difference. The history of Al-Andalus with its mixed Muslim descent and complex settlements from the Eastern Mediterranean and Northern Europe appealed to his philosophical thinking for that reason. Given Iqbal's engagement with modern Western philosophy, Al-Andalus presented a centre ground from which to negotiate the colonised Muslim self and the notion of free will through the philosopher Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd is recognised for his contribution to the formation of secular thought, which became a major force in the European Renaissance. His philosophy borrowed from Aristotle and Plato's analyses of the law and contributed ideas of his own. Iqbal's thought also reflects a shift from a devotional mysticism to rational way of uh, thinking for Muslim communities. He was interested in developing a cross-cultural strategy as part of the reconstitution of a new Muslim personal and cultural community politics. This idea of human agency and the pull toward a greater moral force is part of his well-known poem, Masjid e Kurtaba, the Mosque of Cordoba, which was written in the 1930s when he traveled to Europe for the third round table conference in London and visited Spain in 1933. In his close reading of the poem, the comparative literature scholar Yasin Nurani argues that the poem transforms erotic desire into political sentiment by projecting it on the, onto the masterworks of Andalusian architecture. His reading is suggestive of a turn toward authenticity in Iqbal's poetry as he puts Al-Andalus at the center of an inversion of European history. 
Masjid e Kurtaba is, according to this reading, an example of anti colonial resistance that turns into nostalgia for the lost paradise of Al Andalus. Nurani's analysis is centered on a reading of authenticity. I argue that instead of utopia, Iqbal looks for an alternative to territorial anti colonial nationalism in the cosmopolitan cross cultural mix of Christian, Jewish and Muslim influences and the heritage of Hellenism. Iqbal's referencing of akl, reason in the poem, is an equally powerful force that mediates an all-consuming ishq, love. This inclusion conveys his ambivalence toward communal identity formation in India. In my close reading, I analyze shifts in mood, tone and form to interrogate the subjectivity of the poem and how it might be read cross-culturally. Masjid e Kurtaba opens with the phrase Silsilai Rosa Shab, repeating pattern of day and night, O creator of events. The first stanza of the poem establishes the pattern of day and night, the metaphysical ex explanation of time and space, and confirms Iqbal's linkage to a rich poetic heritage. The Urdu scholar Shamsur Rahman Faruqi notes it lets the reader tap into a variety of traditions such as Arabo Persian, Indo Persian, Indo Sanskrit, and Urdu. Its references to natural and cosmic objects, the rhyme scheme and meter allows eternity to be captured. Faruqi is of the view that Iqbal's poetic aesthetic draws its unique heritage from Vedic and Islamic philosophies of time and being to represent a hybridized literary tradition. And this is what he says makes him immensely readable and distinctive as a modern poet. Later in the poem, the body becomes a receptacle of divinity and the reader may recognize echoes of the philosophy of Wahdatul Vajru, the, the unity of being. But this consuming love is contrasted with the corporeality of the body of the Indian infidel. He is the intermediary between the Sufi and the sovereign, the colonizer and the colonized, a spokesman for a global community. Iqbal celebrates the great mosque as a mujzai fun, miracle of art, and pays homage to the beauty of its endless columns and the minaret. The Miss mosque was built by Byzantine craftsman and is a stunning example of architectural syncretism. It is a historical example of hybridity as Shohat and Stam have noted in their critical discussion on syncretism. The great mosque at Cordoba hybridizes the diverse styles that passed through Spain, Carthaginian, Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Arab, Moorish. In Iqbal's verses, there is no mention of the Christian cathedral that is part of the mosque's reconversion in 13th century. Instead, Iqbal locates the heroic spirit of the Murde Muslim, the Muslim man in the mosque's aesthetic form. He too is eternal. This sea-led prophetic Muslim hero travels across rivers that are peopled with Arabs, Kurds, Muslims, Jews and Christians, crossing civilizations and challenging an inward-looking marginal experience, existence. His spirituality is elastic and his travel transformative. The theme of divine love and the Muslim hero are signifiers of a Sufi poetic heritage that Iqbal borrows from the Persian poet Jalaluddin Rumi and Ibn Arabi, the thinker, and makes it into his own by developing a unique concept of the self, Hudi, including influences from the German philosopher Nietzsche. For Iqbal, the mosque's aesthetic beauty epitomizes the deep connection between the message and the messenger of Islam. The heroic Muslim figure is cast beyond spirituality to the political discourse of citizenship, arguing for an accommodation of the borderless individual, a time traveler, a storyteller, a warrior. This is the figure of the Muslim modernizer who wishes to explore beyond the local networks of the ulema and communitarian politics to form a society based on principles of equity. The, I'm, I'm sort of just going to kind of go towards the end by talking about the la ending of the poem, which is on a mixed note of resignation, optimism and triumphalism. It turns from the mosque to the valley and a pastoral imagining of the simplicity and the melodic quality of the song of a peasant's daughter symbolizing hope. The poet narrator affirms that the future is um, is due to change, letting go of nostalgia and echoing the spirit of anti-colonialism. He emphatically categorizes a life without revolution as akin to death and calls for a community that is committed to action, bravery and revolution. 
There is a worldly cosmopolitan vision embedded in the poem and my analysis on the poet's cross-cultural interpretation that gravitates towards a politics of the self, free will and resistance to the domination of the West. Iqbal's rendition seeks a cross-cultural model to counter the colonial subjugation of Muslim subjectivities in India and the wider Muslim world. His position has elements of authenticity but is not completely dependent on it. The geographic location of South Asia with its hybrid and cosmopolitan cultures is significant and offers a necessary counterpoint to the cosmopolitanisms of the Ottoman Empire and Al-Andalus. It also fractures the idea of a normative universal civilization. In my reading of the poem, Iqbal does not appear to advocate a civilizational discourse of Muslim sovereignty and a singular utopian good life. Instead, his poetic voice suggests through its silences, lyrical rendition and hybrid aesthetics of what a cross-cultural community might be. The poem disrupts the temporality of a universalizing Islamic community. A poem such as this can contribute meaningfully to the theme of cross-cultural cross encounters and decolonizing knowledge with its interpretation of cosmopolitan ideals and hybrid Muslim communities by a South Asian poet understood as a Muslim separatist in India. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mina, for showing, demonstrating very forcefully the power of literature um, to decolonize ideas about Islam and to provide a completely uh, different vision uh, of Muslim thinking from the one that unfortunately circulates around us on a daily basis. So we'll have to come back to that. Um, I thought that was really powerful, this notion of uh, cross-cultural cosmopolitanism. So thank you so much for that. We will now move on to our last speaker. Um, and again, please remember to put questions in the Q&A if you so wish, even before the actual Q&A is open. And so our last speaker is Dr. Simon Rofe. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing correctly, but please do correct me afterwards. Um, so Simon is reader in diplomatic and international studies at the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS, where he co-founded um, the field of sports diplomacy, perhaps he's coming to SOAS. So Simon has uh, worked with key stakeholder in the world of sports diplomacy, um, mainly practitioners, and he has also acted as um, Council for many, many national and international bodies, uh, many of whom you will know, including national Olympic committees, but also anti doping organizations and athlete advocacy organizations. And there are many publications to his name. I will just um, mention his book, Sport and Diplomacy. Games Within Games uh, from Manchester University Press in 2018. And Simon will talk to us about cultural communications, knowledge diplomacy in 2020. So over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Helene. Uh, thank you to Amina and indeed, uh, thank you to um, all of my colleagues for such fascinating papers. Um, it is a privilege to work with such interesting people, needless to say, and it's a uh, no little uh, responsibility to, to use a sporting analogy to play cleanup um, hitter to all of these uh, star performers. Um, but I will nonetheless try over the course of the next uh, 10 minutes or so to give some context to a piece of work I've been looking at uh, embracing knowledge diplomacy. Now, what do I mean by uh, knowledge diplomacy? Well, two things there, one, uh, what do we understand by and how do we use knowledge? And two, um, what do we mean and understand by diplomacy? Well, in some senses, um, starting with the latter first, diplomacy is one of the most um, culturally defined and indeed colonizing um, features of contemporary society. And by contemporary, I would, in my full uh, embrace of diplomatic studies, consider the contemporary to be the last 500 years. Uh, because the diplomatic um, has gone on as long as uh, human um, polities have been able to communicate with each other. And in that sense, 
the diplomatic process involves three core activities, three things that we can recognize whether we are an official of state or uh, in negotiating uh, with a uh, seven-year-old as I was uh, a little before this presentation. And they are communication, representation and negotiation. And in those three elements, when they come together, we uh, see the process of diplomacy. So diplomacy has been, and in some senses uh, is a really good example of the power structures that we think of as constraining, enabling, and indeed shaping uh, the contemporary world, whether at the national level, where there are very obvious national symbols of diplomacy, flags, um, colors, uh, representations of space, particularly national boundaries. Um, and these are things that provide structure and indeed contest to our thinking about the way we live uh, in the world, whether as individuals, as communities, as nations, uh, as nation states, and the distinction there is important between those who represent uh, a nation and those who are uh, operating within uh, the nation state construct. And indeed as global communities and particularly in 2020, we find ourselves touched by many uh, dynamics within global communities, whether that's as a response to COVID-19 or through uh, reactions to uh, Black Lives Matter um, advocacy campaigns, etc. There are a number of ways in which we can see uh, global communities forming and operating through many of the channels that others have uh, spoken about, whether that's through uh, media, through the technologies that um, you know the 21st century affords us, or indeed through uh, the artistic form of poetry, picture, film, etc. But one of the things that uh, my understanding of diplomacy has sought to uh, put forward, and this is where the you know the sport diplomacy dimension perhaps kicks in a little also is to challenge and deconstruct um, what we mean by state-based diplomacy, certainly. And think here about the diplomacies that took place before we had the construction of the Western uh, version of a nation state, before what many of my um, contemporaries in the IR world would think about in terms of, and by art, forgive me, I mean international relations scholarship, um, would think of as the, the Treaty of Westphalia, uh, the 1648 founding uh, document or indeed documents um, of uh, nation statehood but actually the diplomacy had gone on for millennia before then before this little corner of the globe in Europe decided that actually we should organize the world uh, well in central Europe to start with in these things called states and that spilled over uh, over the course of the next three four hundred years into the nation states that many of us uh, well, all of us nearly, uh, live in today, and indeed that we are in many senses blighted by um, in their, uh, addressing um, the global problems that we face. But in doing that and thinking about how diplomacy has, in some senses, been the, the greatest manifestation of uh, colonisation, there is also a, a converse way of thinking about uh, some of that diplomatic practice. And here I make a distinction between uh, diplomatic practice and uh, the uh, diplomatic theory, if you like, or concepts, or indeed um, some of the um, broader international studies scholarship that goes on. So this is why I focus particularly on working with practitioners, be that as you know, the diplomats themselves, because although they may carry official identification, they also carry multiple other identities. And here I'm, you know, often drawn back to the work of uh, Castells and multiple identities of um, self and projection and reaction. And in that sense, the cultural encounters that take place, you know, in the very cliched, but nonetheless uh, true, uh, sort of diplomatic soirees uh, um, with, um, you know, ambassadors being greeted on formal carpets with uniforms and plumery and all sorts of um, ways of thinking about how does that convey those cultural messages and what are the underpinning cultures that transcend indeed those national uh, manifestations so whether that's a national uniform a national dress all of this comes with a set of values a set of normative assumptions that we should be ready to challenge because those cultures in themselves are either poorly represented through the national lens or indeed you know constructed as an other to um, the predominant western version of uh, diplomacy being that you know an embassy an ambassador this is how the world is um, operated in and much of that has been um, codified in things like the united nations through the Vienna Conventions on how to conduct diplomacy, you know, a, a document that was 
agreed in 1951 that took the best part of 400 years to agree on how you do it. And in many senses, it's still very opaque. Um, the idea of diplomatic privilege, for example, diplomatic immunity. These are things that have cultural, huge cultural heritage and not just something that is to be tested when, uh, uh, you know, an ambassador or, you know, becomes uh, involved in a civil uh, or indeed criminal uh, case within a particular uh, territory or sovereignty. But I think this also speaks to the importance of understanding space and knowledge within that, because the knowledge in itself brings with it uh, cultural values. And in some senses, perhaps what I'm saying is not hugely um, novel, but I think within uh, the certainly the last couple of years, and particularly in the last 20, 25 years, in the industry, and I don't use that uh, without thought, the industry of higher education, often thought to be, and indeed, um, you know, uh, established in many regards, to be the harbinger of knowledge, to be the uh, repository, to be the way in which uh, knowledge is shared through different generations. And indeed, you know, the uh, one of the close relationships, and I think this is something that um, requires further uh, elucidation, further research, is the relationship between the research that goes on and the practice and the training that uh, diplomatic practices, whether the diplomats themselves who go to certain universities and end up in certain jobs in certain parts of um, na nation state um, uh, group, groups, indeed, SOAS can look, you know, very inwardly at this, you know, its own establishment uh, as a um, product, albeit perhaps an arm's length one of, you know, the British government as a means of colonial um, uh, representation and negotiation and communication throughout the rest of the the British Empire as was. So I think here is a really important opportunity to look at ourselves and think about some of the epistemological understandings of knowledge diplomacy. And nowhere could be better than that, frankly, in my opinion, than being at SOAS. Um, and I think that's where, you know, understanding how universities in the 21st century are both in some senses in a colloquial part of the problem as well as part of the solution in making sure that knowledge is understood for its cultural and um, political values, not just as a neutral um, uh, or, um, edifice uh, in the 21st century. And to those who you know have a particular interest, I so you know some of us who work in it, needless to say, have you know vested interests, and we would recognise that I'm sure. But we also need to have a, a dialogue with practitioners who step outside you know those um, much vaunted too often cliched uh, ivory towers of academia and that's why working with practitioners allows us all um, and I think it's been evident in the course of the dialogue this evening to talk about other facets of knowledge other ways of interpreting knowledge that aren't just for example according to the ref in written form it's about impacting people's lives um, you know globally and locally and in that sense I'd, I'd, I'd um, share my sort of thoughts of one of the most culturally rich um, experiences of working at SOAS, being able to engage with a large number of people, some of whom in very um, distant lands, but some of whom much, much closer, is to look at an example of um, the town uh, in Bedfordshire of Luton. Now, Luton doesn't get a lot of good rep. It's had, you know, as a town, a lot of issues. It has a significant far right um, uh, um, contingent. And it has a, a huge number, second only to London, of number of different ethnic uh, um, uh, minority uh, groups living within its, its boundaries as a municipality. But one of the things that I found most fascinating about working with a couple of organisations, non-state based, non-governmental organisations in this regard, is to think about the opportunities for cross-cultural exchange through the medium of, in this instance, cricket. And cricket, as a means of talking to different South Asian, across the full gamut of that um, uh, term, South Asian communities, and indeed non-South Asian communities too, but being able to utilise that as a means of uh, engaging in a dialogue that talks to a number of cross-cultural intersectional issues around gender, um, healthcare, uh, education, and tying it through the formal diplomatic channels where appropriate, two colleagues in, uh, and indeed populace in Afghanistan, particularly in terms of girls' uh, participation in sport in Afghanistani uh, curriculum. Um, and as Afghanistan has suffered so much in the last 
15 uh, years, 15, 20 years, being able to make a real difference through our scholarship and through the institution of a university to uh, Afghan uh, girls in their participation in, and enjoyment of a sport such as cricket, I think is made, you know, is, a, is an example of how knowledge diplomacy can work and can be effective, but needs to be uh, sensitive to and recognize all of the cultural um, proclivities far more so than even the economic or political ones. And I think that's where I will leave my uh, remarks to tonight. Um, but thank you very much. And uh, it's been a, a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with everyone. Thanks so much, Simon. That was a great way of ending this panel. And thank you so much for um, bringing a new form of practice to the table, sport, um, and reminding us through your introduction, your presentation of the issues surrounding knowledge diplomacy, that uh, global politics isn't necessarily um, just where it's best politics on the tin, that there are other places where we can, we should actually be looking for where politics is actually happening. Um, and thank you for reminding us that there are many other forms of knowledge than the way in which it's often conceptualized um, in university settings. So that's a beautiful way of ending this panel. And I think we'll now have a discussion with all the panelists before putting it to uh, the audience for questions. Now, I'm not sure how much time do we actually have with the panelists before we open the Q&A. Is the moderator here? Yeah. We have 31 minutes left, so we can uh, okay, use that. So we'll take a few minutes for the Q&A. So I don't know if all panelists perhaps want to show themselves. I'm going to go back to some of the notes I made. So there were really some unexpected uh, threads that connected the different presentations to each other. And I guess um, I would perhaps start um, with uh, Lindiwe's, um, Lindiwe alluded among other, she listed the principles through which her research project is working. And I was quite struck by this notion of knowledge exchange rather than capacity building and this notion of creative partnerships, which I think some of the other speakers also um, brought up in different ways. And I wanted to ask perhaps you both to other speakers in practice, how do we, I mean, this is something we all aspire to, um, more equal practices of knowledge exchange, um, less unidirectional north-south ways of setting up uh, partnerships, but in a current context in which the institutions within which we work are often fighting for their own survival and placing uh, more and more restrictions on our work. And in a context in which, as was mentioned several times, UK and European migration regimes uh, make it so difficult for people outside of Europe to circulate on an equal basis um, with Europe-based academics. How do we actually do this in practice? And is there a way in which the current COVID-19 situation might open up new opportunities? So I don't know who might be able to comment on this. I'm happy to kick off if um, um, I'm mindful that I, I spoke last, but I'll, I think the one of the things that I would point to there is the opportunities for sort of people to people diplomacy uh, as, a, as, a, as a concept, if you like, as a label. But I think what that speaks to is the different communities being finding themselves in the same um, situation to a greater or lesser extent. And whether you're in, you know, Luton or um, Islamabad, 
the scenario of you know not having enough resources perhaps not having enough shelter food you know those basic uh, maslow hierarchy of needs kind of thing does provide a community of practice and the affordances of technology now even in some of those very um you know desperate situations means you can connect with different communities and i think that provides something for you know the human condition of the soul if you might you know uh, you know just as a, as a starting point but i also think it I think it provides a, a sort of experiment bench where solutions can be thought out and applied in different circumstances and you know the resources may be different you know things like the climate may be different and make a fundamental difference to your your, your opportunity um to to put some of these things into practice um you know it's it's difficult to play cricket in a, a bangladeshi uh, refugee camp if it's under two feet of water for example but nonetheless the opportunity to think through these are the steps and some of the knowledge exchange that i've seen amongst practitioners i think is you know is fascinating and heartening and and you know can make substantial difference i think this is where the the role of the university in, in its conceptual times, the knowledge exchange is not for it to necessarily flow through, you know, a door in Bloomsbury to re be regarded as impact, but for it to be construct an environment in which different communities can talk to each other. And I, I, I think that's really where those recognising the, the sort of connectivities of different communities, whether they are, you know, geographically local or indeed spread, you know, that's the, the opportunity that I think we have to recognize some of the challenges such as COVID-19, which is just, you know, global in every sense of its its manifestation, other than individuals being poorly wherever they may be. Um, can I come in? Yes, of course. Go on. Uh, okay. uh, thanks, Simon. You, you, you made me think about, uh, again, uh, the way that I've been thinking about the current uh, global crisis is that crisis is a productive uh, context. Mm -hmm. What we mean by productive is a it's a context that makes us kind of think about issues that we are either not talked about in the public quite a lot, but they need to be examined. Um, but, but I think there is a challenge here, and this answers the question by Tembi in the chat, uh, which is the challenge of funding and the challenge of, you know, the legitimacy and the authority of who is able to to kind of um, uh, begin to probe uneasy questions. I mean, COVID-19 has uncovered, we know about you know, the inequalities in terms of uh, the BN community, um, the, the kind of the, the problems with the lack of access the, to uh, information, the disinformation, fake news, conspiracy theories, and so on. It's just like a big, uh, huge uh, confusion a fog. But I think Simon has brought up a, an interesting aspect, which is it's also a, a, a productive context. It gives us an opportunity to think beyond the, uh, the box. Uh, that's all that I, I think you know, sort of. Maybe some other people would want to come in as well. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Dina. Um, anyone else would like to come in on this? Yes, Marlos. Sorry, I was unmuting myself with the wrong mouse. It's my other computer, <laughs> sorry. I think it's a very important point and it also ties in with something which Adam Habib said this morning. So it's about, um, I've called my forthcoming book Crossing Boundaries. It's not only about crossing religious boundaries, it's also about thinking in the pluriversity to link back to what that your member said. And it also ties in with something which Lynn Dewey said about how do we do actually this kind of collaborative work? Because it's still uh, very often we at SOAS who bring in the research money. So what does it mean to put more names on the cover of a book? Is that really decolonized research? Is co-authoring a form of decolonizing knowledge? I'm not sure if it's still the money which the, the person who is first on the cover brings in. I'm not sure. But I think this crossing boundaries, I chose that um, title because it's also something which I find really important. It's about crossing geographical boundaries. How can we put... Um, scholars from different continents into conversation with each other. And I think the current crisis we are in helps us to bring about this kind of conversation. 
And it's also about crossing disciplinary boundaries. And maybe we should think beyond multidisciplinarity, this uh, key concept in Adam Habib's keynote, and we should think transdisciplinary, uh, whatever that may mean. And I really like the idea of Lin Diwei to bring together people, established scholars and early career uh, uh, researchers in this kind of um, platforms where people um, um, produce knowledge together in as part of a kind of a discussion. I would like to hear more about that. But I think it's more about transdisciplinarity and about crossing also boundaries between academic and artistic work. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. No, this is this is great. <clears throat> Can I just jump in there, Ellen, and say thank you, Marlos. And also, I think I was connecting to things Simon was saying there about, you know, not needing to go through that university door necessarily to create those connections. I'm a big proponent of kind of ground up connections that form uh, authentically between people, real human relationships. I just feel like I've had too many experiences of kind of institutional you know, attempted institutional connections with memorandums of agreement and that kind of bureaucracy that comes very much top down and tries to artificially create these connections. And, um, you know, a lot of the critique around terms such as collaboration and decolonizing in the way they bandied around uh, comes, you know, from, from that, kind of, uh, that kind of spirit. There's an excellent special issue of Journal of African Cultural Studies edited by Carly Kutsier, I always go back to, which talks about these buzzwords as well shares a lot of experiences of scholars in the global south and how they've been treated by research partners in the global north and a lot of it just a lot of the critique just comes down to very simple basic human relationships about how people are treating one another um, and just to say yes with the funding issue as well I'm very conscious you know with my own project that our funding is coming from the European Union and that creates I think an extra pressure to be extremely self-reflexive at every point in the project to come back to what Marlos is saying, we can be quite skeptical about, yes, to what extent does co-authorship and all of these other, you know, things we're trying to do, uh, you know, how equal is that when we look at the origins of where the funding is coming from? So it's a big responsibility we have to, um, to be very open, I think, to be critiqued as well, to make ourselves vulnerable to critique. And I think we do that through the live, uh, through the live connection, whether that's live online, or live research that many of us have spoken about in the, in the panel as well, that the scholar who only works with texts kind of puts themselves, you know, shuts themselves in a room and doesn't allow themselves to be vulnerable or to, to be critiqued. Can I uh, also jump in following on yeah. from the interview? Um, yeah, I think all those are, are really great points. And one of the things I was thinking of there was with regards to the projects that I've been involved in, um, which have been to do with Muslim representation and Muslim communities, and especially the Muslims Trust and Cultural Dialogue project, which was very much about working uh, with with sort of community groups here as well. Um, and I think when we going back to the first project, when we did Framing Muslims, and it, this goes back to the question of funding and who trusts what and what kind of collaborations and we had gone for a presentation at uh, University of California at Irvine and uh, and people there were very suspicious. Well, not everybody, but some of the scholars were very suspicious that this was funding that was coming from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And they did not think that that was kind of a free space for us to be researching something that was so highly emo charged in terms of sides and, and I suppose, you know, Irvine had particular kind of relationships uh, with regards to to that question. But we certainly I, I feel going back that was 15 years ago that that was I was maybe naive as a scholar at that point, but I just didn't think that the British system at that point, the, the funding system was was that directive or that research funding was that um, kind of um, had that level of surveillance attached to it, perhaps that we feel more so now, I think, especially. And when we were working with the Muslims Trust and Cultural Dialogue Project, I think there were a lot of questions asked about who we were funded by and whether people felt because, you know, this we're talking about this in the in a time of prevent and in a time of how um, communities are under surveillance by the state 
so how free do you feel to talk to researchers you know we're, we're sort of coming from a particular perspective and although asking people to trust us but you know that trust is being embedded within the structures of funding that are coming via a state dynamic and um, the state the, the relationship of the state to those minority communities is very fraught so that kind of diplomacy question is, is really interesting that that Simon's talking about as well there so I think what what sort of I felt towards the end of that research because we had some some amazing conversations and we did a lot of work but there was a lot of, there is still a lot of stuff that I cannot put in writing and that I cannot um, you know that that people did not want to speak openly because they did not feel that this was something that was fully trustworthy and so it, it it is a question it is a question of how uh, uh there was a turn in funding you know global uncertainties all that sort of um research um funding direction and flow is is kind of connected and it's topical and it's important but it's also to what extent does it really allow the freedom for the scholar and the and the sort of person on the ground that you want to collaborate with and you want to engage with do they even want to collaborate with you on that basis that that was the real challenge for us in that project yeah no that's it's a very important point you just made and i just want to point um point out to a, a very interesting uh, point that was made in the chat and which had actually wanted to embed in my question but which didn't come across is the very real issue that UK universities actually take quite a lot of the funding, uh, which we often want to direct to external partners, um, including in, in countries of the South. Um, and that's I think we've lost Helene. Let me echo her point while we try and get her back. Okay. Um, just to say that I think that's one of the real uh, difficulties of working within the higher education structure, and particularly of universities. And this is, you know, the university model in itself is something that has colonized um, to a greater or lesser extent. And we shouldn't underestimate the, the, the influence and, and shaping influence of British and Western universities on education more globally. And I think this is where actually working with other partners. So for example, working with, you know, sporting sector, as I have done, you know, since, um, well, really London 2012, from my point of view, um, that that has actually been a far greater enabler of um, dialogues and putting people, uh, you know, having the conversations that you wouldn't have otherwise, because the university is not necessarily a helpful way of having that, that conversation. Um, and you know the the skill, as it were, and the degree to which um, I've mastered it, others will judge. But is to to bring some of its relevance into the universities through the university's front door, but actually to leave a lot of it outside, and to leave a lot of it to be communicated and and um, engaged with by practitioners across the piece, and not um, you know as as a, as a metric of of you know um, uh, something that the Western colonial experience has, has brought to us so i think the it's another reason for us to think about how knowledge rather than you know some of the manifestations through things like universities and research councils come to bear helene we have you back yes i'm very sorry it's something happened Not with at my all. connection <laughs> these are the vagaries of those kinds of situations yeah. what i wanted to come back to was a very important point i think uh, Dina made in her presentation. So Dina, you, you talked uh, very eloquently um, about the this notion of narratives being used at, as resistance. And you also um, said that you, actually many uh, narratives are not heard at the moment and many communities are actually invisible in this crisis in which we are. Um, I recognize parallels with Africa. Very few people know actually what is going on with COVID-19 in Africa. And yet I'm absolutely certain that there are things we can learn from the way in which 
um, African states and African communities are dealing with the crisis at this current moment. Um, but we never hear that. So how can we use knowledge and how can we use narratives from these regions in which we work um, to actually um, provide solutions to deal with this crisis, solutions for the future? And particularly, how can we disseminate this knowledge when we can't even physically go there? Very good question. Um, uh, it's a very good question and comment. Um, I don't think I have the answer. All I can say is that we have to keep trying. I mean, this is the role, you know, how do we see our role as academics, as teachers, as activists and so on? We try and think of ways of uh, engaging uh, with, with these communities. So in a sense, I keep reading whatever, whatever comes up. And, you know, you really have to search these days. Um, if, if you are, you know, you can go on social media and you find a lot of stuff, but you, you sometimes worry about, uh, you know, kind of fake news and issues around that. So I think the question, the, the issue is to keep engaging. And, and, and in, in response to, it, it's, it's, it's the permanent uh, kind of struggle of visibility and invisibility, of being heard and not being heard. So long, it, it has a long history. Um, of of denial or kind of not 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 recognition of the other in different ways, and we have a lot of stuff around that in the post-colonial uh, scholarship. But I think in terms of um, you know there was a question by Tembi, which is okay. So how do you frame your research for it to be accepted? And it's very difficult because you know if you want to get funding and you say, well, I want to go and and write about. Um, you know, stories and, and narratives of ordinary people living in a continuous state of uh, conflict or a, a liminal state. Uh, it's, it's a continuous liminal state in the case of the Palestinians. What does that mean? You, you won't get funding. It's just a matter of you kind of persevering to try and uh, write, you know, and, and try and do uh, something around it. Um, but I think, you know, because we were talking in this panel and the other question related to that. So, you know, just very briefly, I don't want to take people's time, but if we go back to the book uh, I authored, which is what it means to be Palestinian. Um, it, what I found is that one of the things that helped me is to try and not impose a, a frame. It's not to have a frame to describe what is going on just allow people to speak in their own voice and not even editing what they, not even kind of taking it and, and making a thematic analysis out of it. And somehow this, you know, kind of attracted some filmmaker who wanted to do something similar. So it can happen, but it, it kind of a fluke, mm -hmm. you know, I just think about it as, well, you know, I don't know how it happened. Um, but basically, it's just, you know, it's just a part of our mission, you know, why, why do we do what we do? Um, and what is the reason behind that? And it's just a question of being too, you know, being committed um, and interested uh, and um, kind of engaged uh, with what you're doing, uh, that you are able to produce something uh, kind of interesting about it. But I, I see the COVID-19 crisis as giving us the context within which we can begin to speak back and begin to uh, make visible these, you know, you know, African ways of dealing with uh, with COVID. How how are you know, how are people living their lives? It it will be very productive. It will be very interesting. You know, think about it as the same as Simon was speaking about sports. You know, think about it as a way of uh, a new way of encounters and so on. Sorry, I spoke too much. I want others to come. No, that was great. Thank you. Um, the issue I have now, because I was thrown out, uh, I can no longer see the questions that have appeared in the Q&A. Um, so, so sure, yeah. if you see any question here that is to you or that you'd like to address, could you raise your hand? Because when you go back into the meeting, you can no longer see them. 
So first Marlos and then Simon. I think there was a question from Anneke Newman. Um, um, Anneke, I don't see you, but nice um, uh, after such a long time to see your name again on the list. So how we can bring in, uh, what are the kind of journals where we can publish more creative work? And I think that's a very difficult question and probably other panelists have better ideas. Um, I published a photo essay together with um, Akin Tunda Akinlea and uh, many journals were quite interested in that new format. So, um, and it is a very, I think an interesting way of presenting work. Um, so photo essay is one opportunity. Um, and I think many journals have this kind of open call where they ask for special issues once or twice a year. And you can bring in, you, well, you can bring in your own idea there, um, like a special issue on, on creative work. Well, I think it's time for uh, journals to rethink how they um, disseminate knowledge. And I think we, as the ones who are contributing to these journals have an important role there to play. Well, I think there is a way and we have to be creative, which also means that we have to rethink our own role because very often we have different voices. So we write differently when we write a journal article or a book than when we write a blog. Why are these voices are so different? Why can't we not bring our own voices more into conversation with each other? Um, why do we think that to theorize means that you have to use a certain discourse? And I think being a teacher, and all of us are also teachers, um, where we sometimes have to, mm, well, express our knowledge in a different way for people to better understand. Why are we not using that in our own books and in our own writing? And I think so it's time for us to rethink our own voice. And I think then also journals will probably pick that up and also change the way their the formats, how you can present knowledge. Mm. Right, thank you. And Simon, do you also wanted to address a yeah. question? Yeah, um, I, I think um, I'd, I'd certainly echo Marlos there. I think the alternative ways of presenting our research is, you know, is, is a, a necessary, absolutely necessary function of, uh, of our job in the future. I just pick up on the question uh, that Rubina asked um, 10 minutes ago or so about an equal world. Um, I'm afraid I don't, I'm not hugely optimistic about uh, the equality of our post-COVID, um, post-Brexit world. Um, I do see reasons to be uh, hopeful in other regards, but I think equality um, is not necessarily something that is, is top of uh, a lot of agendas or indeed feasible given the structural forces that are work which is why they are so it's so important to be aware of them and so important to be able to challenge those um, those structures and forces that exacerbate inequality and lead to greater stratification of societies I think one of the features of our contemporary world is being able to think about the things that um, bring us together in other ways and in that sense I think equality um, can be equality in not just in you know perhaps traditional economic terms of you know equality of, of um, opportunity or equality of finance and, and but actually equality of thought process and equality of access to um, you know what the sustainable development goals offer all of us um, every member of the human race up to 2030 they're not without their flaws by any stretch but they provide a, um, a means and a framework for action and particularly the way that they can be manifest through things like uh, education for, for girls um, in large parts of the world, um, for you know, utilisation of uh, sport and physical activity as a means of uh, encouraging education and sustainability. I think these are the things that give me um, you know, reasons to be cheerful and wake up in the morning. But I think uh, equality, as it was understood in the 21st in the 20th century, is not necessarily going to be a feature of our global society for the next, um, you know, generation. I would say, sadly. Okay. Yeah, I think we all worry about this um, and about the state of the planet. These two things, <laughs> we all worry about which way things will go. Um, other, two others have a couple questions. Of questions that I have. Uh... You know? Coming to me, so I'll just quickly answer them. Rubina asked about whether the British Empire featured in the work of other South Asian poets writers of the time. Uh, yes, yes, in, in lots of people's works. I mean, um, Mahali, who was the predecessor, there's also Shibli Nomani, there's uh, Firak or Akpuri. So that there are a lot of people around at the time who are writing. Um, 
that that you can pick up on another question was about uh, we talked about situating narratives early from Sanjukta in the discussion what is Iqbal's legacy among the youth today is there a need to read Iqbal's cosmopolitanism vis-a-vis the current trend of identity politics interesting question Iqbal's poetry I mean I was I was talking about it in a very writerly way but it's it's definitely poetry that is appropriated by both radical groups and by secular groups so it's a question of um in in terms of political rallies and all those types of events who is going to be using what part of the poetry and in what way and that's really important in terms of knowledge uh, development and how it's taught in um in in the education environment what parts of his poetry are being um applied because you can take anything in in context you know in the context that it helps you to communicate the message that you wanted to convey so in in increasing identity politics world that can be used in very particular ways um asma there was a question about fundraising for the arts and charity sector which is not to me which is just going out to everyone there was always caution on the parts of the organizations i've worked for about suspects sources, national lottery, etc., links to Israel. So about funding and its connections, where does everyone has a question about the ethics of funding nowadays? And, and I think young people ask that question a lot more. Um, and and so are we in, in terms of how and where funding is coming from. Um, whether that transparency is available to us or not is another sort of question. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I, I I did. There's another question for the panel. Does the panel despair that we are still wrangling with hypernationalism and race, especially institutional racism and education policing recently in the NHS? I don't know. That's a huge question. Yeah, it's a huge question. Um, there is perhaps time for one final answer, if anyone would like to take this one. Perhaps we could ask you, Helene, what have you taken from this experience? Uh, you mean the yeah. <laughs> well, it's um, these are all questions we're grappling with, and I think you are all setting the bar very high in terms of um, rec- reflexivity in research and and trying to go that extra mile in um, you know addressing all these obstacles of funding, bureaucracy, um, surveillance from the state, the impossibility of people to get access to visas of technologies Um, but you're showing that there are ways in which we can establish um, more equal collaborative uh, relations and I also think this notion of disseminating our work in different ways um, is absolutely crucial I mean we're not we are not all going to be uh, spotted by Zadie Smith for a novel, clearly, that, that was at the top Malos, but there are other ways of disseminating our research with I, sh- I think would be uh, both more impactful and more equal and uh, reach far beyond the confines of universities. So I think you all demonstrated this in, in powerful ways and really set the bar very high for the rest of us. So thank you for that. and. Um, just to close, I should probably invite everyone to attend the keynote lecture, which is starting just now with Professor Falun Gum from Boston University, a fellow Senegalese who is going to speak on the Odyssey of Ajami um, and this little known tradition of writing African languages in Arabic script, which I know well from Senegal and which I think Falun Gum is really the world expert now. So this should be fascinating and I will all invite you to join. Um, it reminds remains me to thank all the panelists for outstanding presentations, um, for a great discussion, and of course, all the participants for great questions and to apologize for my internet problems and you know coming late and all of that. I really enjoyed this. So thank you so yeah. much to you all. Okay, thank you.